السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين uh, This is a session where I answer your questions or the questions that were asked during the session, the essentials course I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to aid me in answering all the questions We start with, uh, we'll start inshallah with the first question Bismillah. The question says, when laying on a side and praying, how do you face the qibla? Okay, this question is regarding a person who is sick. We said that if a person is sick, he prays standing up. He was unable, then he prays sitting down. If he was unable, then he prays on his side. If he was unable, then he prays on his back. This is from the hadith of the messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Now the question is, he's saying when laying or when lying on your side, uh, how do you face the qibla? It's when you lie on your right side or left side, whichever is easier, it's better to lie on your right side, but whatever is easier for the person, he should be facing his, the qibla. His face should be towards the qibla. So he's lying on his right side, his face should be towards the qibla. And if he was praying on his back, lying on his back, then his legs should be towards the qibla. Okay. Uh, the question says, a woman isn't supposed to walk in front of a man praying. What about the wife passing in front of her husband while he was praying, even though there was a sutra, like a chair or something? Okay, first of all, we understand that from the Sunnah of the Messenger, Muhammad Wasallam, if a person was praying and he did place a sutra, which is, you know, a barrier, it could be a stick, it could be like a chair, anything should be placed, uh, something should be placed in front of him. So that if people pass uh, in front of the sutra, there will be no harm on his prayer. But if somebody or something decides to pass between you and that sutra covering, then he should be prevented. He should be prevented. That's the son of the Messenger Muhammad Wasallam. And it was said that if a person or something passes in front of you, between you and the protection, the sutra, the cover, then this will decrease the reward. Now there's a hadith that mentions three things, the woman, the, the dog, and the donkey. They said that uh, the Messenger وسلم, said الصلاح, that these things cut the prayer. Scholars have differed. Is cutting the prayer, does it mean that it will invalidate the prayer or does it mean it will decrease the reward? Uh, there are different opinions. Uh, the majority Allah alam, say that it decreases the reward. But if a person has played a co placed a covering, something in front of him, you know, like a stick or a piece of wood, which is, you know, an, uh, which is around uh, 50 centimeters or 30, 30 centimeters or something like this. Uh, this will be enough protection for him. And it will be a covering that if somebody passes uh, in front of that covering, then it will not affect his prayer. So if someone placed a chair and then something passed in front of the chair, inshallah, this will not harm his prayer. Okay, question says, during, uh, when wiping over footwear for each leg, the hands should be made wet separately or wetting once and wiping over both feet? طيب, when wiping over the footwear, we mentioned that of the conditions is that it should be worn over a complete water purification. So if somebody made wudu and then he wore, uh, he, he wore, for example, socks or any footwear covering the whole place of wudu, and then when he wanted to do wudu again, it would be sufficient for him after washing all the other body parts to wipe over the footwear. And wiping over the footwear is something very simple. As long as both hands are wet, you can just move your hands, uh, wipe, wipe uh, the footwear, move your hands over the footwear with the intention, and that's it. That's enough, inshallah. Uh, can we perform sunnah mu'akkada during forbidden uh, times or necessity times uh, yeah, you know this is a big uh, dispute among the scholars between the Jumhur and the Shafi'i but uh, inshallah if it was uh, the prayers that have a cause for example the Sunnah Mu'akkada inshallah they can be prayed 
in the dislike times. An example of this is that the Messenger Muhammad وسلم, prayed two units after Asr, and Asr is a dislike time. So this showed us that uh, praying Sunnah prayer that have a cause, that have a cause, not any Sunnah prayer, Sunnah prayer that have a cause, okay, like the routine prayers, for example, the Rawatib, can be prayed in dislike times, Wallahu uh, Alam. Okay, so Sujud al Tilawa, yes, yeah, Sujud al Tilawa can be done anytime. Okay, in any situation. Without even, we said we took the opinion that uh, it's not a prayer, so the conditions of prayer does not apply here. طيب. The other question is that if I am combining, the, the brother here or the sister is saying, if I'm combining Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha, is it better to pray them? Uh, for example, Dhuhr and Asr, is it better to pray it in the time of Dhuhr or in the time of Asr? Whichever is easier for the person. Yani the option that is easier for the person, he can apply. They're both the same. So if, you, if you're planning to combine Dhuhr and Asr, of course there's a cause because you're unable to pray it at the time of Dhuhr or the time of Asr, you do what is more appropriate and what is more suitable in your situation. They're both the same. They're both the same. As long as you have a proper, uh, you have a proper excuse to combine prayer. Okay? And we said combining prayer uh, can be done any time where a person... Had, well, it will be difficult for that person. There's hardship. If there's hardship, he will not be able to pray both prayers in their time. So it is permissible uh, to combine the prayer in this case. Uh, now the question goes, during travel, 80 kilometers are counted from the end of the limits of the city or from the place of stay. They're not from the place of stay. Okay, They're from the limits of the city. The limits of the city, as in well, where the buildings end, where the buildings end, and not from the limits as the borders. We're not talking about borders here. We're talking about the limits as when a person, when it, when a person can start the concessions of travel. Remember, we said that if a person uh, traveled, when can he start the concessions of travel? If he passes the limits of the city, the limits of the city, as in the buildings. Okay. Al-Bunyan, as they say, the buildings of the city. Uh, the example that we gave, for example, between, Mid between Dubai and Abu Dhabi, you know, after passing the marina area, there is a stretch of land which has no buildings. They're just small, you know, uh, what's called companies. So this is where a person can start the concessions of travel. While a person who was living, for example, in Mirda for Rashidiyya, he has to travel all the way until he crosses the marina, the marina area. So the marina area will be on his right side, and with it will be the end of the buildings. You'll find after that there's just a stretch of land. There are not many buildings. You know, after some uh, distance, you might find small buildings here and there, just companies. So yes, here you can start the concessions of travel. Here is where the distance starts. So it's 80 kilometers from here. Okay. Uh, the question goes like this, is there an opinion where one can keep uh, shortening his prayer in travel, even if it's 40 days? Well, you'll have, look, there are many opinions, many opinions, okay? Especially in matters of what is the limit. But, you know, the safest thing is what the Jumhur have said, the majority is four days. And we said, you know, if you look at the meaning of this, uh, why is it four days? We said if we if you go for five or six or seven days, inshallah, in travel, it's still permissible. So if a person intended to travel for one week, example, and then come back, then we say this one week, it's considered a travel. But let me ex explain something here. Let's say a person intended to travel for 40 days, 40 days, and we said 40 days is not travel. Does that mean the first seven days he can use the concessions of travel? He can combine and he can shorten the prayers and then after the eighth day or the ninth day, he prays normally? No, of course not. For those who attend my lectures, you know that this is wrong. When we say uh, seven days, he had the intention to travel for this amount of time. And not that for the start of travel, I mean, the first seven days he can use the concessions of travel and then after that he has to pray normally. This is, this is not what we said. طيب. Uh, okay, the question goes like this. I'm living in Jeddah, in a big, it's a big city, and I'm living in a place in Jeddah called uh, Bani Malik. Can I shorten 
uh, after leaving Bani Malik, if I am going to travel, oh, is this another question? Okay, uh, the question is, if I am going to travel to, uh, to another country, uh, to, my aunt's, uh, to my aunt's house, for the purpose of study, for three to four months. Okay, three to four months, you're not going to be a traveler. Okay, it's difficult to say. Three to four months, I say, yani, yani, um, take precaution. Okay, so you're not a traveler, and just pray normally, alhamdulillah. Uh, regarding this first question, uh, I'm, leaving, I'm living in Jeddah, it's a big city, I'm living in a place in Jeddah called Bani Malik, I don't know the place, but once you, if you travel to a distance of 80 kilometers or more from the limits of the city, after crossing the, the limits, as in the buildings, then in this case you're a traveler, okay? So I just gave you the principle and you can apply it in your situation. When we go on vacation to our home country, or, or any other country, we keep moving between states every week. And apparently it's more than 80 kilometers between them. So can we do qasr, use the concessions of travel? Can we shorten the travel, uh, the prayer every time we move from states? Yes, let's say that you're traveling uh, for, let's say two weeks. But it's not gonna be in one place. It's going to be three days in one place. And then you're gonna be traveling a distance more than 80 kilometers to another place. And then you're going to be staying three days in the second place. And then you're going to be traveling a distance more than 80 kilometers in the, to a third place. And you're going to be staying there for three days. Here, we say that continuously you're, in, you're a traveler. Because you're a traveler until you reach the destination. And then once you reach that destination, you're going to be staying three days or less. And it's not your home place. I mean, it's not you, you don't have a house there. You're not a resident. You're a traveler. So you're going to be using the concessions of travel for these three days, and then you're gonna be traveling to the second place for staying there for less than, for less than uh, for three days, which is uh, a time a person is considered a traveler, and so on, and so on. So as long as you're not staying in a place, in a, in a specific place for more than one week, nine days, eight days, يعني, you're considered a traveler, wallahu alam, okay? And these matters, if you have doubt, if you have doubt, يعني, be cautious. خلاص, consider yourself a resident. Anytime that you have doubts, well, I don't know, يعني, it's, uh, am I a traveler or not? يعني, act on what is fundamental, that act that you're a resident, okay? Uh, the hadith, okay, the question goes like this. If a woman goes walking to the masjid in the first hour, this is regarding, apparently regarding Jum'ah prayer, will they also get the same reward for men? Okay, first of all, the Jum'ah prayer, it's an obligation on whom? On the men. Women, alhamdulillah, their prayer at home is better for them. Their prayer at home is better than them, better for them. So the woman should stay at home. This is better praying, her obligatory prayer at home is better for her than praying in the masjid. But if she does decide to go and attend the Jama'a, the masjid, the Jum'ah prayer, will that suffice her? Yes, the prayer of Jum'ah, the masjid will suffice her. She does not need to pray Dhuhr. Now the question, these rewards, are they specific to, um, to men? Allah alam, Allah alam. But even if these rewards include the woman, it is still better for her to pray at home. SubhanAllah, look at this. Yani Allah Azza wa made it easier for the woman. When we say that these rewards are specifically for, 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 men, uh, for men, that doesn't mean that the women are excluded from these rewards. No, it means the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu made it easy for the woman. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, who gave these rewards for the men, made it easy for the woman. If she prays at home, she get she gets the full reward. What is what is intended for her? Yani Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala wants her to pray at home. Khalas, it's better for her. You're gonna please Allah if you do this. While men, if they do pray at home, yani they miss out on a lot of khair. Their prayer won't be a complete prayer. They're gonna miss out on a lot of reward. But for women. If they act on the message of, of the, on the command of the, of the messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praying at home, they will get inshallah yani a complete reward, inshallah. Tayyib, uh, good question. Um, the question goes like this. This is a congregation question. Um, if a person joins 
at the second rak'ah, so he joins the congregation the second rak'ah, then should he raise his hands after the tashahud as it's his first rak'ah, but the imam, it's his third rak'ah. Okay, uh, the brother is talking about, you know, when you, when you rise up from the second unit, it is sunnah to raise your hands. Once you stand up straight, to raise your hands. Okay, that's a sunnah. But he's saying, since it's going to be my first unit, what should I do? We say follow the imam. The imam, for him, it's the second unit. So khalas, you're in the terms of the actions of prayer, you're copying the imam. Okay? Of course, you're going to sit down because you're following the imam here. And then once you separate from the imam at the end of prayer, here we say you continue your prayer, you build on it. Okay? Wallahu alam. So yes, you raise your hands following the imam. Okay, another question. Uh, the question goes like this, very interesting. Men have opportunity to gain lots of reward going to the mosque and rewards attached to Jum'ah. How can women gain rewards like these? Or will they always be lagging behind in terms of rewards? SubhanAllah, of course not, of course not, SubhanAllah. The women, especially those who are housewives and living at home, if they're doing their part, making it and preparing the food, taking care of the kids, but they have the intention of doing all this khair. They're rewarded for this intention because they were not commanded to do, they were commanded, their obligations are at home to do these things, you know, to, uh, to take care of the kids when the husband is away to take care of the wealth. So, of course, if these commands were for the men, that doesn't mean that men are better. Of course not. Of course not. Yani, if the women, they do their part, they pray the sunnahs, they do dhikr, they recite Quran, they take care of the home. And subhanAllah, especially if they're making the food for the husbands, they get the reward for the actions of the husband because, you know, the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِنِيَّاتُ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مَرِئِ مَا نَوَىٰ Actions are but by intentions and every person will only get what he has intended. So if the housewife was smart and she, she makes the food, preparing the food for the kids and for the husband, having the intention that she's preparing them for worship, strengthening them for worship. This, she will get the reward of everyone. She will get the reward of everyone, especially at times of Ramadan. You know, she's busy preparing the food, the futur, and she's praying, preparing the suhoor. Ya Allah, she's getting the reward of all the actions. Because if it was for the man, okay, for example, if the man wants to go, if the husband wants to go in the first hour of Jum'ah, he wants to go in the first hour of Jum'ah, and because he knows that his wife is taking care of the kids and home, he's able to do that. But he knows also if it wasn't for her, he wouldn't be able to go in the first hour of Jum'ah. And she gets a lot of reward for that because, it's of, because of, she's the cause of him going. So do not underestimate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given everyone their own, uh, as they say, doors of good deed. The woman, the wife, the mother, the sister, she has her own good deeds. To Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from her, her own worship, and the man has his own worship. Okay. Uh, okay let's continue. Now, is it okay if, if a man does not attend Jum'ah as he is afraid due to the pandemic, even after the government has allowed it? Look, it depends. It depends on the, t on the person. Okay, is he sick? Does he have a weak, you know, immune, immunity system? Um, there are some problems. He, he has some problems and some risks of being infected. Or he's living in an area where it was said there are a lot of infections here. A lot of the virus has spread. It depends on case to case. But generally, and if he acts on causes and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, wearing uh, the mask, having his own prayer mat, uh, trying not to mix, inshallah, he is safe, he is safe. You know, you have to be in the middle. You do not exaggerate and, you know, fill your heart with fear. At the same time, you do not neglect and be careless. You have to be in the middle. You act on causes and you trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? Is there a reward for women in congregation or before that? What is the ruling for a traveler on a Friday. طيب. Alhamdulillah, salatu salam ala Rasulullah. A traveler, there is no Friday prayer on a traveler. So if a traveler, you know, he's passing by and people are praying Jum'ah, he doesn't need to go and pray with them. He's a traveler. There's no Jum'ah on him. He just enters the masjid at any time and prays Luhur and Asr together. Okay, that's simple. Now let me 
there's a, where's the problem? Where does the problem lie? What if he goes into the masjid and he prays Jum'ah with them? He gets the reward of Jum'ah. No problem. Zalla khair. But can he combine Asr with Jum'ah? This is the problematic matter. And you know, there's a lot of dispute. So, Wallahi, Wallahu alam. My advice is for him to be cautious and to be secure and take the safest opinion which is do not combine Asr with Jum'ah prayer. Do not combine Asr with Jum'ah prayer, okay? Wallahi, this is the safest opinion. This is the safest opinion. And this is what I act on, subhanAllah. There's so much dispute, so much dispute. And I still don't feel comfortable then regarding uh, the other opinion. Wallahu alam, wallahu alam. If you hear a fatwa from uh, a bigger sheikh, a sheikh, you know, that you trust, and he says uh, you can combine Jum'ah and Asr, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, but I don't feel comfortable yeah, any suggesting this. Uh, is the sick person, are they exempted from Jum'ah obligation? Yes, if you're sick, then of course you don't need to attend the Jum'ah. Just like any other action, act of worship, if you're sick and you have the intention, Allah Azza wa will give you the reward full and complete based on your intention, even though you did not, because there's something that's stopping you from doing this act of worship. Uh, is there no reward for women in congregation? There is reward, but the thing is, I don't know what's uh, the question. If you're co talking about congregation in masjid, it's better, as we say, for the woman to pray at home, but if she wants to go to the masjid, she can go to the masjid. She gets the reward. She wants to listen to some Quran to renew her faith, increase her faith. She can do that, but fundamentally, primarily, her prayer should be at home. Okay, this is better for her. This is better for her. Um, uh, Allah rewards for your intention for whatever you do for his sake, even looking after the house. Of course, for this for the sisters. Of course, if you're at home looking, taking care of you know, the house at home, of course you're going to get a lot of rewards. I remember when one of my relatives, they were complaining, say we're just 24 hours. Uh, we're looking, we're taking care of our babies. You know, they're too young. They need... Uh, we're breastfeeding. Most of the time, you know, we're busy with them. Yeah, we used to read a lot of Quran, but now we're unable. Hey, subhanAllah, of course you're going to be, this is what's stopping you from doing all this khair. This is what's preventing you. There's a responsibility here, and you're taking care of this. Uh, you're, you're dealing with this responsibility. Inshallah, you're going to be getting your reward full and complete from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is our opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This religion is easy. This religion is easy. Everyone has his job. Everyone has his own responsibility that he should be taking care of. Okay, in Jum'ah, when the Imam is making dua, should we raise our hands in dua? What is the correct etiquette? Okay, Wallahu alam is that you follow the Imam in Jum'ah prayer, in, uh, in khutbah, in the sermon. If he's, if he's going to be reading the khutbah, if he's making dua, he's not going to be raising his hands, so you don't raise your hands. One, if he's if he's if he was going to um, call make du'a for rain istisqa, you know pr uh, prayer for rain or make du'a for rain, he's going to be raising his hands like this. In this case, the followers, those who are listening to the khutbah, they should also raise their hands. Okay. In okay, a certain country, almost all the masjids pray a duhr prayer on Jum'ah because of the pandemic. Should we follow the? Should we pray a duhr prayer at home? on the day of Jum'ah instead of, of going to the masjid. I mean, if there's no Jum'ah in the masjids, then khalas, you pray a dhuhr. Okay, if there's no Jum'ah, you pray a dhuhr. Is it true that the sermon is of the other two rak'ahs? So the two khutbahs of Jum'ah are instead of the two rak'ahs? Yes, this is what some of the madhabs have said. Is it allowed to offer any form of supplication to Allah during the momentarily pause between the two khutbahs in a Jum'ah prayer? Uh, in a Jum'ah prayer, it is allowed to offer any form of supplication. Okay, between the two, between the two khutbas, a person should stay silent. Well, there's nothing. There's no du'a. There's nothing. So they should stay silent at this time. Wallahu alam. I don't know of any dhikr or anything that is said in this short period of time. Okay. Especially some people they use it for istighfar, but I don't know. There's nothing يعني, in the Sunnah what to say in this short period of time between the two. Uh, between the two khutbas, between the two khutbas. Just stay silent, wallahu alam. Tayyib, as a traveler who's joining Jum'a prayer on the way, uh, since he will normally do Jam'a al-Qasr for Dhuhr, should he join the Imam 
with the intention for zuhr, zuhr or jum'a. If you join the imam for jum'a prayer, pray jum'a with him. And then don't pray asr until asr time enters, and then pray asr two units if you're a traveler. One should make dhikr too while listening to the khutbah. If you're listening to the khutbah, you stay silent. Okay, you stay silent. Unless he mentions, uh, you know, the messenger Muhammad Wasallam. you say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no problem. If he makes a dua, you say, Ameen, yes, no problem. Okay. Uh, let's continue. Uh, one should okay. What are the difference between sermons and one? The khutbah, the sermon is the translation of what the khutbah is. We say sermons as uh, we mean the khutbahs. Okay, is that we translate it, it means khutbahs. Uh, what if there was no jum'a sermon done and they just uh, got up? And they prayed four rak'ah. Is that a valid prayer? If there was no khutbah, then there's not going to be a jum'ah prayer. So they're going to be praying it four rak'ahs, which is dhuhr. Okay, which is dhuhr. Uh, the khutbah of jum'ah and the khutbah of Eid, they have the same importance. Okay, for those who have attended, uh, you know, the workbook number three, when we talked about Eid prayer, now you can differentiate of the differences between the two khutbahs is that you don't have to listen to the Eid khutbah. And the Eid khutbah is after the prayer. Well, the Jum'ah prayer, uh, well, the Jum'ah khutbah is before the prayer. Uh, if, you're, if you go and listen to the Jum'ah khutbah, it's an obligation for you to stay silent and pay attention, listen. If you're, doing, if you're listening to the Eid khutbah, uh, there's no problem if you talk to the person next to you, but of course it's preferred to stay silent and also listen and benefit from the khutbah. Uh, at present, mosque. At present, the mosques are closed. Is it okay for a group of men to pray Jum'ah in the workplace? Uh, you know, I, I choose the opinion that Jum'ah is prayed in the masjid. Jum'ah is prayed in the masjid. If there was no Jum'ah in the masjid, uh, there's no obligation. If the Imam decides that there's no Jum'ah, you follow and you just you know pray Dhuhr at home. Okay, because praying Jum'ah in, ho- in houses, this is a bit problematic. Wallahu alam. Is it okay to go for a far masjid than a closer one to your home? No problem. No problem. To listen to a favorite sheikh on a Jum'ah day, yes, there's no problem with that, inshallah. Hmm. If you're performing Tahiyatul uh, Masjid, the two units entering the masjid, and the iqama is called for the prayer, do you continue praying or do you stop your prayer and join the congregation? Well, it depends. If you're in the first unit of Tahiyat al-Masjid and the Iqamah starts, you cut your prayer and you go join the, iqa- the, the Jama'ah, the congregation. And when you cut your prayer, you don't need to do salam alaykum. You just, you know, cut it and just go to the uh, congregation. Uh, but if you were in the second unit after Ruku'ah, you know, there's so little left from the Tahiyat al-Masjid, you can continue, you can, if you know that you can finish your prayer and join the Imam before he starts his opening takbir, then do so. Continue your prayer, okay? Okay, you talked about the question regarding Jum'ah and Asr. We spoke about this, that, you know, we chose the opinion not to combine Jum'ah prayer with Asr. Uh, but if you're traveling on a day of Jum'ah, and it's the time of Jum'ah, you pray it as Dhuhr. So in this case, you can't pray Dhuhr and Asr together, yeah? Do not mix up between the two. If you're a traveler, it's Jum'ah time, but you're a traveler. You're going to be praying it alone, so pray it Dhuhr, and, uh, and you can combine Asr with it. So if you went to a masjid, and uh, not in the time of Jum'ah prayer, but I mean before it, uh, or I mean after it, and you wanted to pray Dhuhr and Asr together, you can do this. You can do this, okay? But if you attend a Jum'ah prayer, and you pray Jum'ah, we do not combine Jum'ah with Asr, Wallahu a'lam. And those who are late to Jum'ah prayer, say they try, some of them people, they come late and they try to go forward, passing over the shoulders of the people who are sitting. I have, I have heard that this is not correct. Yes, this is not correct. And the Messenger Muhammad Wasallam said, you know, do not harm the people because they're losing their concentration. Just pray whatever, as, you, as soon as you enter the masjid, find a place, you're late. 
So you want to distract the whole jama'ah, you should not do this. You should just pray wherever, wherever you find place as soon as you enter. And as they said, لا تتخطى الرقاب. You know, do not uh, pass over the shoulders. Just sit down, pray. Unless and you were an imam or there was a, there was a real need for it. Uh, for example, your place is in the first row and you went to the toilet and then you're coming back. Uh, of course, here you're excused. You're going to your place. Uh, if you are traveling and join Jum'ah prayer, now uh, we mentioned this. Okay, so you said we talked about combining Jum'ah and Asr. Okay, after Jum'ah, can I pray two rak'ah? Oh, okay. Okay, question goes, I heard that when traveling, if we find residents who are praying Jum'ah, then we pray Jum'ah with them, but we cannot, uh, we do not do Jum'ah, we do not combine the prayers. Yeah, this is, Wallahu alam, this is the correct opinion. If masjids are closed, then can Jum'ah prayed, uh, can Jum'ah be prayed in a dedicated prayer hall? It's not a masjid, okay? Jum'ahs can be prayed, uh, may be prayed in masjids only. Allah Adam. Uh, standing up during the sermon for Imam, is it a sunnah? For the Imam to, to give the khutbah while standing up? Yes, this is the sunnah. Is it mandatory to have the khutbah in Arabic language? No, it is what's beneficial for the people. If the majority are English speakers, you know, he can start it with Arabic, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning some of the verses in Arabic, and then he can, you know, give them the, uh, talk to them, give the whole sermon, the whole khutbah in English. Wallahu alam. Okay. Uh, praying two rak'ahs until the, uh, praying two units, two units until the Imam arrives. This is the sunnah. It can be, it can be duha prayer because this is a time of duha. Uh, reciting Al-Kahf in the whole day and night mentioned here is a Friday night or Thursday night. Uh, the day and night of Friday, when is the night of Friday? Laylat Al-Jumu'ah is after Maghrib prayer on Thursday. So you can recite Surah Al-Kahf from after, uh, after Maghrib time of Thursday. So you're going to be in Friday night. So you know that because the, you know, the Arabic uh, days start with after Maghrib, after Maghrib, okay? So Thursday Maghrib, after Maghrib, you're in, you technically are in Jum'ah. So you start, this is where you start sending uh, blessings to the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu saying, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Muhammad. And this is where um, you can recite, start reciting Surat Al-Kahf. Uh, preferably, and according to the Sunnah, what should be the content of a khutbah? The khutbah, a khatib, the person should be giving advice and something that is beneficial to the community, uh, especially with verses and from the hadith of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu making, giving them advice, something that is best for them, for their religion, okay? Guiding them to what is better, making it short and concise to the point, to the point. As short as not in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but I mean uh, making it to the point. To the point, do not stretch it if there is no need for you to stretch the khutbah. Allah alam. Okay, uh, with this we have finished the Q&A for the 19th session. And, okay, it's 33 minutes. Halas, with this inshallah we'll end and we'll try to do another video with the 20th session. Or the 19th session, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to aid us. Hada wallahu alam wa sallallahu ala nabiyina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Uh, your questions automatically, if you write your question in the essentials class, any question that is not answered, that is not answered during the session, inshallah, will be given to me, inshallah, for me to answer in this Q&A session. Zakum Allah khair for attending and Zakum Allah khair uh, for giving me your questions and giving me your time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless your time and give you the barakah. In your knowledge and time. Hadawallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadawallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadawallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadawallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadawallahu alayhi wa sallam.